We are starting a brand new series today titled Believe the Impossible. And what I'm going to do with this series is not only share with you the future vision of this church, so get excited about that, but I also, come on, come on, what God is doing in this place, um, but I also am going to challenge your faith. I want to challenge you in your personal life right now, and I want to ask you this question. Do you believe, like truly believe that God could do the impossible in your personal life? Do you believe that God can do something right now that you've been praying for and holding on to for so long, but it just doesn't look like it's ever going to happen? I want to increase and strengthen your faith through this series. Amen? And so to do that, we need to dive deep into the word. And so I want to ask you this question first. What is faith according to the Bible? If I were to ask you this, what is the definition of faith? What would you write down? In fact, go ahead and write something down. What do you believe faith is? And then I'm going to give you a simple answer, okay? Write down what you think faith is. Now, here's a simple answer I want to share with you. According to the Bible, faith is believing God before seeing any difference. Faith is believing before seeing. Faith is believing that God is doing something even though my life still looks chaotic. Believing that God is working on my behalf, believing that God is fighting for me, that God has good things for you, even though everybody's talking about you, right? And life is not going the way you thought it would go. It is believing before seeing. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. I love this. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. Underline hope, okay? Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things, listen to this, that we can not see. We believe before we see. So I'm asking you this powerful question, do you believe that God is doing something big in your life right now? Do you believe that God can use you? I've talked to people before and they said, you know what, for a long time, for many years, I felt like God was telling me to start a business, you know, to to do this thing. And I've had this dream and I've had this vision and they've shared with me confirmation after confirmation, like God is telling me to do this. And I I lean in, I'm like, all right, so what happened? Well, I didn't do it. What, What do you mean? You just told me that God confirmed it. God spoke it over you. How come you didn't start the business? Well, I was afraid I was gonna fail. Or it was too risky, right? I, I just, I don't think I'm smart enough. I don't think I have the talent to do something like this or the money to do something less. So I just, I just didn't do it. Or I've, I've talked with people that said, you know what? I believe God confirmed over my family that my family life can be restored. But instead of acting out in faith, you held on to bitterness or resentment. You're still holding on to something that somebody said about you years ago when God has told you to release it over and over again. And and, and so I'm just believing that God wants to challenge our faith to see something big in our life. Because you know what's really easy to say? And we've all done this. We all have said this before. We've looked at our life, we've looked at our situation, and we've said, well, nothing's going to change. Nothing's ever going to get better. This situation's never going to change. That person's never going to get better. They're never going to be better. I'm never going to be better. I'm always going to struggle with the same things over and over again. I'm telling you today that is a lie from the devil because he wants to attack your mindset because what you believe makes a difference. How you think changes how you live. And if you believe God for the impossible, let me share with you right now, you will see the impossible become possible. Not because of your strength, not because you're smart enough, not because you're talented enough, not even because you have all the money in the world. No, it's only because of God. When you follow him and put your eyes on him, he will show you his mighty power and authority, but also most importantly, his love for you, that he has never given up on you and that everything good that you have in your life today is because of him. And so I want to change your perspective with this. In order to step And to God's promise for your life, what is the first step? You have to believe. It is that simple. In order to step into the promise that God has for your life, you have to believe. That's the first step. And the second step is walk by faith. And the scripture gives us a warning, though, something that might shock you. Uh, The passage uh, in James chapter 2 tells us that, listen, even demons have faith. 
In fact, Satan knows the scripture very well. Demons have faith. The difference is they don't follow God and they don't live for God. Okay? And so what the Bible is telling us is, listen, you can have faith, but you also have to walk by faith to see a change in your life. James chapter 2, verse 19 and 20 states this. You say you have faith. For you believe there is one God. And I like how it says this. Good for you. (laughs) You know, good for you. You say it. But even the demons believe this. And they tremble in terror. Why do they tremble? Because they don't have a relationship with God. God wants a real relationship with you. He wants to shake up your world every single day and show you how good he is for you to hear his voice. When's the last time you heard his voice? Has it been a while? Have you been busy? And I see people come to God, and, and in that moment, they're broken down, and they feel and they get excited. But what happens over time, life can, like, choke that out of you, right? And I've seen people completely turn away, and we talked about this. I've even seen people witness a miracle in their life, but once they got the miracle, they're done. There's so much more than that. God wants a real relationship with you because even demons believe in God, but they tremble in terror. And it says, how foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? Now, we are not saved by our works. We are saved by our faith in Jesus Christ. But because that faith should change you, you should also see good works. There should be a transformation happening in your life. The way you speak should not be the way you used to speak, okay? The way you act, the way you react, and I get it, there are times where we just lose control, but God's overflowing grace continues to mature us and change how we live. But I think, I think we make it complicated. I'm, I'm going to be honest. I think we make it complicated because in our head, when I say believe the impossible, most likely you're trying to fit it into your life, what makes sense to you. And so when I say believe the impossible, when some people are like, yes, pastor, I believe. Maybe for her, she's believing for that six foot three Jason Momoa coming in or good for you. I think I said that right, maybe. (laughs) Uh, But good for you. Yeah, you believe the impossible. God, I believe the impossible for my relationship or I believe the impossible for my job. I'm going to get a promotion. I started at the bottom. Now I'm all up at the top, right? Because that makes sense to us. And I believe sometimes God is looking down at us like, you think that's how I'm going to challenge your faith? That's cute. (laughs) Let's dive into the word and really ask the question, how is God biblically going to test your faith? And the first point is this. He will tell you to prepare for something you have never seen before. I love that. Have you ever heard of the phrase, be careful what you ask for? telling you today, be careful what you pray for. Because we'll pray, God, challenge my faith. Okay, build a boat. What? Build a what? Build a boat. A gigantic boat. In fact, animals are going to come on this boat, and it's never rained before. Nobody's ever heard of rain. It's going to rain. There's going to be a universal flood all over. I want you to build a boat. Or God is speaking to you. I'm going to use you to go into Egypt and free my people. What, God? I just... I just wanted to pray over the neighbor like I'm having a hard time with him. And and God is going to challenge your faith with something you've never seen before. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7 states this. It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. It was by faith that he built it and he obeyed God because he believed. And God warned him about the things. And I love this. Underline never, that had never happened before. Never seen before. This has never happened. God revealed to him what had never happened before. And we've talked about this. Uh, Many scholars believe that Noah built the ark anywhere from 50 to 120 years. It took him that long, possibly. A long time. So imagine building something. Everybody's mocking you. Everybody's making fun of you. And every day people are like, where's your God? Where's the miracle? Where's the judgment that we hear about? Where where, where is it? Where is it? And you're like, I don't know. You just keep building. It's not your job to know. You know God's already spoken it over you. You just obey. And eventually it's going to happen. Noah had faith 
because he believed God. He worked on this boat before it had ever rained. And by his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world. And he received the righteousness that will come by faith. But it also makes me think, why does God challenge our faith in such a way? Like, why does it make it more simple? Because God wants to prove to you that he can do the impossible. Because I've realized something. We like possible. You want to know why? Because when it's possible, it's in our control. If it's possible, that means that I can control the outcome or I can work hard towards this, or it will make sense in my life, and I could do something about this. But God will allow the impossible to happen in your life to show you you are not in control, only he is in control. And he is the only one that can intervene and do something supernaturally in your life to save you and save others. Because he loves you. Because you mean that much to him. And Paul stated it like this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, Paul stated that the rulers of this world have not understood it. For if they had, they would not have crucified our glorious Lord. This is what the scripture means when it says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard. And I love this. No mind has imagined what God can do, what God has prepared for those who love him. God has all these things planned for you that we can't even imagine today. Jesus told the disciples over and over and over again what would happen to him. They still didn't understand it because it would seem impossible that the Son of God will be crucified upon a cross and then rise from the grave three days later. But guess what? Today we know this is possible. We know that the Son of God conquered the grave because there is nothing that can stop our Lord. He's not limited like us. He is limitless. He can do anything that he wants. And so imagine truly believing this because it should change your life. What's your prayer life like? God, please help me. Hopefully, get me through the day. You know, like, I hope something happens, Lord. What do you mean you hope? What do you mean? Why are you speaking like that to the God that created all things? Pour out your heart to him. What do you need? Ask him. Tell him, God, what do, you, what do you want me to do? God, I got this situation in my life, but I believe you could do something that I cannot see today. And I believe that you can bring me peace right now. And it doesn't even make sense because my life has crashed down and I'm hurt. But I trust that God will heal that hurt. He will do what no eye has ever seen for those that love him. He's already accomplished that. So The title of this is Believe the Impossible. I want you to believe. So let's look at the definition of that. What is the definition of believe? The definition is this, to accept as true. To accept as true. Now, what is the definition of impossible? Not able to be done. I believe that God can do what nobody else can do. And he will prove this to us because what God wants to show us is that he can do what no man, no person could ever do on this earth. In fact, Jesus said it best in Luke chapter 18, verse 27. I love this. This is powerful. What is impossible for people is possible with God. I mean, that hit me hard this week. I just shared it online. What is impossible for people is possible with God. So again, what does your prayer life look like? Are you really praying for God to do something amazing or are you just trying to get by? Why? Because you're tired? You're frustrated? You got to go to work? Believe though, you were created in his image for a reason. And every day can be exciting as you follow the Lord. I've realized this in my life, that the Christianity that we see out of this Bible still lives today. But a lot of us are just in tunnel vision with our own life and going through the motions. God doesn't want you to go through the motions. He wants you to believe the impossible. I truly believe that. 
So believe the impossible. God will tell you to prepare for something you've never seen before. The second point is this. God will always ask you to hope for something better. Hope is very, very powerful. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. I love this. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed God when he called him to leave home, to go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance. And a lot of us would say, okay, I'd do that too. All right, God's telling me I got this land for you and it's going to be great. Here's this big blessing. Okay, I would do that, but let's look at the next line. He went without knowing where he was going. (laughs) We like to leave that part out. God, I I know you got something grand for me, something great. You're going to change my life, and I'll move when you show me. Or I'll go, but what is faith? Believing before seeing. And Abraham believed before he even knew where he was going. And I started to think about this. I remember it was the middle of the night. I'm driving my family, literally in the middle of the night, from Louisiana to North Carolina. Everybody's asleep. Nobody's talking to me, but I keep hearing voices in my head. Not weird voices, but just my own thoughts. I'm going to clear that up. All right. I'm about, turn around. This is dumb. Why would you do something like this? It's not the time right now. You have a child that needs medical help. Why would you take your family to somewhere you've never been before just because God is telling you to do it? This is irresponsible. And I remember this because I was battling this. And if you know the story, when we were in Louisiana, I, I've been in ministry for a long time, but things just got really complicated and frustrated, or we became frustrated for a time. And I believe that God made us uncomfortable to get us to move. Because <laughs> temptation, when you're comfortable, that is the biggest temptation. Well, I'll do it one day, but I'm pretty good right now. And we were comfortable for a very long time until my daughter was born. And then because of all the medical complications and just life changing and we were tired and and by the grace of God, my wife had a lot of grace on me with that whole situation because it was hard for me to touch my child. I mean, I love to hold her. But at that time with the trach, if I held her the wrong way, that trach comes out, she can't breathe, she dies. It was that scary. And it was hard to sleep at night. It was, it was hard to get rest. Even if she was sleeping well, my wife had to get up in the middle of the night and, and suction her because she had to suction mucus for her to be able to breathe. And in my head, I just thought that God would make it easier within ministry. And ministry was piling up. And I had this event and that event. I'm like, I can't go to nothing. I can't do anything, God. I'm just, I'm just frustrated. And I remember being in the living room late one night. And, and God just revealed to me, and I felt it so heavy that he was telling me to move to North Carolina to work at Elevation. That's really what I heard God say to me, Elevation Church. And I went to my wife later and talked to her. I said, hey, I think God is telling us to move. And she goes, that's weird. <laughs> I've been hearing God, too. And I'm like, what, you, what have you been hearing? She goes, I've been hearing that we're supposed to move to North Carolina. And I said, why? Because I didn't know much about Elevation, to be honest with you. I didn't know that Elevation Church was located in North Carolina. And when we found that out, we're both like, whoa, that's a little bit different. And so let's pray about it. And we started to get more confirmations. And I had a, we had a dream, or she had a dream, where we were in the car. It was fully packed. And we were leaving. We were leaving home. And I would not put my foot on the pedal. And I've shared this before. I wouldn't put my foot on the pedal because I, was, I still didn't want to go. And so she put her foot on the pedal. <laughs> Thank God for a good woman. <laughs> and, and we left. And it was, it was so weird. It, it didn't make sense. Like, it didn't have the money. I wasn't promised a job. What happened was I got approved to get into what's called a 2K2 program. Six months. Six months to maybe get a position. Six whole months. And so we were praying about this. And and not only that, but I was the provider of the family. And financially, it would be very hard. Very difficult. What was I doing? And I'm in the, the car, driving the family in the middle of the night. And all I'm hearing is, you're a bad father. You're a bad provider. Why would you just risk something? How selfish of you. And I keep hearing these thoughts, and then all of a sudden, I remember, though, God's voice being so clear, I got you. I got you. Because I was 
we both were just driven by this hope that there was something more to it, that God was doing something really special. Do you realize we left everything we knew? We left family. We didn't know anybody out here at all to follow what God was telling us to do. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it states this, now faith is the assurance of things that are hoped for. Hope will keep you going. Hope, listen to me, hope is what drives faith. And then by that faith, you walk by faith and move to trust God through the process. But in the beginning, for that foundation of faith to move you, you must have hope for something better. You must have hope that God is doing something. Have you ever met somebody who has lost all hope? In a relationship, if you're willing to fight, but the other person has lost hope, what happens? It dies. It dies because that hope has to be the foundation, that there has to be something better. It's by that hope that I move by faith. And listen to me, the devil's strategy is always to attack your hope because if he can, if he can kill your hope, you give up. You have no foundation to keep going and you will start to say those things over your life. My life will never get better. This is all I will know. This is all I'll ever be. Where's your hope? If you're saying this today, and some of you, I, I get it, you have been attacked by life. And I'm gonna ask you, where's, where's your hope? Have you lost hope for your family? Have you lost hope for your happiness. In fact, I believe there could be somebody in this room today where you've completely lost hope that you could ever be loved by anybody. The Father loves you more than you know. He loves you so much that he sent his one and only son to die for you on the cross. You were not lost. And let the Father restore that hope in your heart today to keep going. It is a fight, I get it but it's worth it to trust God, to have faith in the things that you're not even seeing yet. And I love this because out of the book of Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah reminded the Jews, it doesn't matter what your circumstance looks like right now. It doesn't matter how bad things are. You've been taken out of your land. You've lost everything that you had. And now you're in captivity and you feel like you're not your own. But don't you worry because what God speaks will be fulfilled. And it doesn't matter what your circumstances look like. You've probably, probably heard this before. Jeremiah 29, 11 through 14. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good, not for disaster. To give you a future, and with that future, there comes a hope. And in those days when you pray, I will listen. You will look for me wholeheartedly, and because of that, you will find me. I will be found by you, says the Lord. I will end your captivity and restore your fortunes. I will gather you out of the nations where I sent you, and I will bring you home again to your own land. God was speaking to his people. I will take you out of your bondage and make you free again to an inheritance that is yours. For some of you today, that is what God is speaking to you right now. God wants to take you and release you from the bondage that you've been enslaved to for a very long time that's been weighing you down to make you free and show you that there's something good for you. But listen, the first step you have to believe is true. And you have that belief because of the hope that comes out of the word of God. This is your weapon against the thoughts in your head. But God will ask you to hope for something better. And my third point is this. I like this one. God will make what seems laughable a reality. That's what I love about believing God for the impossible. Because God will give you ideas. He will show you things. He will bring confirmations, dreams, and visions, and you will hear things and be like, yes, but you tell other people. Sometimes that's a big mistake. Hey, look what God's going to do with me. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. And we feel defeated, but it's not up to them. It's not up to them for you to pursue your calling that God has given you. 
It's up to you to walk in obedience. I mean, think about it. Even having a child. Even having a child when everyone else laughed at the possibility. In Hebrews 11, verse 11 and 12, it states, It was by faith that even Sarah was able to have a child. Though she was barren and was too old, listen, she believed that God would keep his promise. God had confirmed this over her life. So because he has confirmed it, he will keep his promise. And so a whole nation came from this one man who was as good as dead, a nation with so many people that like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore, there was no way to count them. But do you realize how many times they laughed at the idea? Exactly. God spoke this confirmation over their life. This is what I have for you. They left their land. We just talked about Abram and Sarah. They left everything that they knew to follow God, yet even hearing from God and seeing these miracles, they still had times where they laughed at what God said. Genesis 18, 11, and 12, Abraham and Sarah were both very old by this time. And Sarah was long past the age of having children. So she laughed silently to herself and said, how could a worn out woman like me enjoy such pleasure? Especially when my master, my husband is also so old. Let me tell you, it seemed impossible to them. And they laughed. How many times have you laughed at God? How many times have you heard God say, I'm going to change you. I'm going to change your family. (laughs) Ha ha. Or I'm going to use you in your school. I'm going to, I'm going to change your school through you. Uh, God, people are mean. Or in your workplace. God, nobody likes me. Or, or, or anywhere else. And you've been praying and it seems laughable that God would give you this miracle. Or maybe you can relate to this. Maybe you have been praying for a child. And it feels so confirmed from God that he would do this miracle, but it seems laughable. I'm too old. There's, there's no way. Or, it's not possible. But I want to remind you today that if God has confirmed it, and I mean truly, if he has confirmed it, it will happen. He can make the impossible possible. And even the mighty man of faith, Abram, laughed at the idea. In fact, Abraham went a little further. Genesis chapter 17, verse 17. Then Abraham bowed down to the ground. And he laughed to himself in disbelief. How could I become a father at the age of 100, he thought. And how can Sarah have a baby when she is 90 years old? And listen what he says because of his disbelief, verse 18 and 19. So Abraham said to God, may Ishmael live under your special blessing. Ishmael was not the promised seed. This was his son at a wedlock with a maidservant because he took things into his own control because God wasn't working fast enough. What they wanted, they wanted it right there. It wasn't happening, so they took things into their own hands. But this was not the promised seed. Yet, realize what's happening in this moment. Abraham is giving up the dream. He's giving up everything. Just just take Ishmael then, God. It's settling, it, it disbelief, just laughing to the floor. And God says, and I love this, God replied, no. Sometimes God is going to wake you up. <laughs> I believe sometimes you're going to come in this room, you're going to pray for the miracle, and you're like, God, I, I just don't know. Just, just, you know what, just, just have this. And God's going to be like, no. No, because what I have for you is good. And the enemy can't steal that. He can't take that away. Nobody can break What I have for you. And God said, Sarah, your wife, she will give birth to a son for you. And you will name him Isaac. And I will confirm my covenant with him and his descendants, an everlasting covenant. Even though Sarah laughed and Abraham laughed, God reminded them what may seem laughable today can also become a reality. Do you believe the impossible? I'm serious. Do you believe that God can do something crazy today? I did mention something about our story. So even though we left and we packed up everything, we're coming to North Carolina. My wife received a phone call from a friend. And she goes, hey, I had this weird dream about you guys. 
My wife goes, okay, what was it? She said, I had a dream that when you got to North Carolina, you would plant a church and it would grow so fast and quickly. I think she even said that they would move out of here. My wife told me that. You know what I did? Ha! No. <laughs> nope. No. No. I'm already moving everything that I know to get a little bit of money to maybe get a position. I'm not going to get all the way out here and just be completely broke. Like, what am I going to do? I don't know anybody. There's no way. We've done evangelism before. I don't want to go back down that road. I got three kids now. I had one and it was hard at that time, but now I got three, Lord, one with a medical condition. But I didn't know then that God would take care of every need. In fact, I didn't know then that the medical doctors we needed were actually here to be able to heal my daughter so she could speak and breathe on her own today. We left before we knew. And we had faith because God said it. And I believe it. I I want so badly the same for you. I want God to become so real to you that it changes your life and how you make decisions. That you start to hear confirmations and you start to take it seriously and you start to write it down. That's something that God has taught me as I pray, as I listen, write it down. And sometimes it may seem laughable, but you date it. And I'm telling you, you go back to it later and you'll be like, oh yeah, God did do that. And I laughed at it then. I laughed at it. To enter into your calling. You must first believe the calling that God has given you. So I've waited almost my whole sermon to give you the title of today's message. (laughs) You're welcome. But the title of today's message is Believing Your Calling. That is the first step. To believe your calling, you have been called. Do you believe it? And will you walk by faith? And as we study Abraham... We know that God gave him a promise for his descendants, but the promise would not fully be fulfilled without the impossible becoming possible through many stories and through many descendants of Abraham until we get to a man named Moses. And most of you know about Moses. Let me quickly just kind of give you some background. Abraham and Sarah would have a son named Isaac, and through Isaac came Jacob, and then came Joseph. And if you know the story of Joseph, he had the dream, and he ended up next to Pharaoh after a long hardship, a long, uh, a lot of trials, being thrown into prison and almost dying, but he was able to interpret dreams. And because of that, God brought him from prison to be right next to the Pharaoh. And his family comes to visit because of a famine. He forgives them. They all move to Egypt, right? And they're living in this land in luxury. But what happens? Time passes pretty quickly. And the Bible tells us that eventually a new Pharaoh rose up and and Joseph and his family had died. And this Pharaoh did not know the Hebrews. And he did not know the story. In fact, he saw them as a threat because the Bible tells us that they became so numerous in uh, Egypt that he was afraid of them. Exodus chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. In time, Joseph and all of his brothers died, ending that entire generation. And their descendants, the Israelites, had many children and grandchildren. In fact, they became extremely powerful and filled the land. And eventually, a new king came to power in Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph or what he had done. And what he decided to do was to make these Hebrews his slaves. And so he also ordered all newborn males of the Hebrews to be thrown into the Nile River. But God saved one baby. God saved one baby. Listen to this. Because the mother had hope. You realize that? That's why Moses' life was saved. A mother risked everything for her child to believe that God would save him. And she had hope. And so she placed him in a basket and put him by the bank of the Nile. And eventually the daughter of Pharaoh found him and raised him as her own child, naming him Moses. And Moses grew up as an Egyptian with power, with wealth and status from the king's family. But then we see that one day everything would change. And he sees his people, Hebrew being hurt by an Egyptian, and he takes it so far that he murders this Egyptian. In Exodus chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, he went out to visit his own people, the Hebrews, and he saw how hard they were forced to work. During his visit, he saw an Egyptian beating one of his fellow Hebrews. 
After looking in all directions to make sure that no one was watching, Moses killed the Egyptian and hid his body in the sand. And eventually his secret was going to get out because the Bible tells us that the next day he came back and the Hebrews were talking about this. They knew. And then Pharaoh found out. And once Pharaoh found out, he wanted to kill him. And so what did Moses do? If you know the story, you know that he fled. He left everything. He was scared. Now imagine, though, he's leaving everything that he had, knowing he's a murderer. He let the anger get the best of him. He feels hurt. He feels alone. He doesn't know where he was going at all. And then the Bible tells us that he ended up in Midian. And he met the priest of Midian, and he fell in love with his daughter. He married her, had a child, because he ended up saving her daughter from a situation. And and here's what's crazy. Moses stayed there for about 40 years. If you know numbers in the Bible, they mean something. And 40 out of the Bible represents a time of testing. I'm a testing of faith. So isn't it funny that Moses was here for 40 years? you imagine that long waiting This is as good as he'll ever get. In fact, if you notice the scripture, it says that he attended his father-in-law's flock, which means he didn't have his own. He didn't have his own. He didn't have wealth. He didn't have anything anymore. He lost everything. He ran away from everything. He was a murderer. I'm sure his identity was being attacked in his head. He was in hiding. Some of you right now, you're in hiding. You've made some awful mistakes. You said something in the past. You did something, and you have been hiding from people. But listen, you cannot hide from God. But God wants to meet you exactly where you are today to bring a healing and restore your faith because there is still hope even when we do wrong. There's still something better. And God replaced that hope with Moses. And for the rest of the sermon, I want to share two points with you. And, and today is just setting up the foundation of this series. It's going to get better. It's going to get good. I'm, I'm really going to encourage you and challenge your faith with this series. But I want to see how Moses encountered God at the burning bush. And the first point is this. God did not speak to Moses until he had his full attention. I don't know if you realize that according to the story, but God did not speak to Moses until he had his full attention. Listen, when Moses saw the burning bush, he was consumed, and it said in Exodus chapter 3, verse 3, it's the amplified version. It states, I must turn away, Moses said, from the flock and see this great sight, why the bush is not burned up. But again, Moses is turning away from his job. He's turning away from his flock that he's supposed to look after, which means he's risking a lot right here. He's risking a lot because he's seeing something that's supernatural and he feels this pulling. And now listen to this. When the Lord saw that he turned away from the flock to look, God called him. I'm going to say that again. When the Lord saw that he turned away from his flock, God called him. And he called him by name. He said, Moses, Moses. And Moses came because he gave God his full attention. So let me ask you right now. Maybe you're struggling with hope. Maybe you're struggling with your faith because you are not giving God your full attention. You're so busy with work. And the job title that you have, the position that you have, the things that you got to get done. And I get it. It can be a lot, and it could be hard days, and maybe people are hard where you are. But if you don't give God your full attention, how can you hear from God? If you don't set your eyes upon him, then how are you going to be able to hear your calling and have hope? Because most likely, every day, you're going to go through something. And somebody's going to say something, and it's by his word that God will give you direction and a peace, and a joy. And again, like I said, the devil wants to attack your hope. He wants to take it out. I'm not giving our full attention because everything, I'm telling you right now, as soon as your eyelids open in the morning, everything you see is fighting for your attention. And the typical Christian today spends about maybe 30 minutes in the word of God in the presence of God. And most likely it's from the Bible app 
from one scripture without context. Just being honest. I will look at something randomly and be like, okay, check it off my list. I don't want that to be a check because that's not gonna change me. I realized something. Moses saw a marvelous miracle. This, this bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. Crazy, right? That's not what changed his life. In fact, he could have seen that and walked away. His life would be no different. It's when he gave God his full attention and encountered God that his life was changed. It was then that he had a calling. So for some of you, you've seen miracles. You've seen God come through. But did you encounter his presence? Did you hear his voice to hear the calling, the hope that he wants to place inside of your heart that there's something better to believe in something you haven't seen before? That what may seem laughable today can easily become a reality. And here's my last point. And again, we're just getting started. A lot of people don't realize this. But Moses was restored by Christ in this moment. Moses was restored by Jesus. Let's look at the text. Exodus chapter 3, verse 2. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire. From the middle of the bush, Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it did not burn up. And many scholars believe that the messenger here, the messenger of the Lord, is Jesus Christ. And we see this throughout the Old Testament many times. Because we know, according to the Bible, that no man can see the Father and live. To have a full conversation, you, you can't handle it. He's too almighty, he's too powerful. John chapter 1, verse 18, no one has ever seen God. But the one and only Son, who himself is God, and is the closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. And so what I'm telling you today is in this moment, Jesus is the messenger. And we've seen him throughout the Old Testament with Abraham, with Sarah, even Hagar, or Hagar. Genesis 16, 17, excuse me. The angel of the Lord found Hagar beside a spring of water in the wilderness. This was Jesus coming to a woman that they abandoned and sent out of the camp. Jesus was meeting her too. Jesus kept popping up and every time he popped up, he restored the faith and the hope and the joy. And in this moment in Moses' life, his life change happened because of encountering Jesus. Again, he could have seen the miracle, walked away, nothing would have changed. But when he encountered Jesus, he was restored. How was he restored? John chapter 16, verse 23. Verse 24 says this, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. You will ask the Father directly and he will grant your requests because you use my name. Now listen to what Jesus says. You haven't done this before. You haven't done this before, but now you can by using my name and you will receive and you will have abundant joy because of the son we can talk directly to the father so in this moment as jesus is encountering moses he's also showing him his calling and his purpose exodus 3 10 through 12 now go for i'm sending you to pharaoh you must lead my people israel out of egypt but moses protests to god who am i to appear before Pharaoh. Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? I'm gonna have you stand right here. I want you to be very honest with yourself. How many times have you said, who am I? Who am I? I don't, I don't have what it takes. I can't believe the impossible. There's no way that I could ever do something. I'm not, I'm not talented enough. I don't have the money. There's no way that I can get there. There's no way that this can happen. Who am I? Who am I? Who am I? Let me tell you who you are. You're restored by the blood of Jesus. You've been redeemed. Let me tell you, your body is the temple of God for the spirit of God lives inside of you. And when those moments come, God will also speak through you and he will use you to show you things you've never seen before. He will take those that can't speak and speak through you like Moses. Moses said, I'm not good with words. God said, don't worry. 
I will speak through you. For when the time comes, my spirit will pour out of you. And I'm telling you, it's the same for you today. It's the same truth for you today. You keep saying, who am I? No, stop looking at yourself and look to God and see who he is and what he's already accomplished and what he will accomplish. And then you have faith that will move mountains and take down giants. I fail every day. He never will. He never will. And because of that, I will always believe and trust him. Moses was a murderer before, hiding in fear without any money to his name. Exodus 3.12 says, God answered, I will be with you. And this will be with you. And this is your sign that I am the one who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God at this very mountain. Mount Sinai is where he met God, where he met Christ. And I started to think, because I remember the process I went through, what we went through getting here. And I remember hearing from God after elevation, that's not where God wanted us to be at that time. And God was calling us to plant a church. And I remember being outside in the backyard and praying, God, who am I? That's pretty much what I was saying. I, how could I make this possible? I, I, I don't know anybody. I don't know anybody. And God gave us this crazy idea start filming and I was mowing and I walked inside said hey God told us to film my wife's like okay you're weird but I and I did Facebook live on my phone praying preaching from my backyard neighbors started mowing all kinds of stuff would happen every time I did it and God led us to one opportunity after another within a few weeks this man saw it he had faith. He allowed me to preach in his car shop. And then it got difficult because Gabriella needed brain surgery. She needed her trach out. And that was the night that I said to God, who am I? I can't, I can't do this. I can't make this happen. And I remember so clearly stating that night, God, if you want this to happen, you got to make it happen. And it was the next day that everything changed. The next day. And I'm going to share that story over the next few weeks. Believe me, what God is doing here is a miracle. What God is going to do through you is going to be a miracle. Hey guys, this is Pastor Bobby Chandler, and I just want to say thank you so much for watching today's message. We pray that it blessed your life, but do me a favor before you just click off of YouTube, make sure you subscribe to our channel and also ring that bell so that you get notifications on the next sermon or any announcements that we have going on. I also want to say thank you for being a faithful partner with Authentic Church because of your giving, we are able to bless and impact the people around us every single week. So we love our Authentic family and thank you today for joining us.